Well, hello, kinesiology students. Uh, it's Mr. Crenny here, and I'm going to talk to you today about sports history. And really, we're going to talk about this big idea, the idea that sports reflect their time in history and culture. Sport reflects history and culture. Very rarely is sport a driver of history. Uh, often they reflect what's going on in the world at the time. And we have a number of different examples of that. And this video is meant to supplement some of the notes where you'll see some details about how sport reflects its place and time in history. Uh, today, I'm just gonna supplement that with a couple of ideas about how sport reflects its place and time in history and in culture. And we're gonna start way back at the beginning with ancient civilizations. What was the first sport you may ask? I don't know. I don't know if anybody really does. Maybe Adam raised the Eve to the first tree. I don't know. But when we have recorded history, we see a few things that pop up in sport that are repetitive. Over and over again, we see a few of these ideas. Number one, we see that most sports are individual sports. We see running and wrestling and boxing and maybe javelin throwing or horse racing. And a lot of those things are individual activities. Now, why? Well, back then, most people are subsistence farmers. Um, maybe they're living off of uh, the land. They're separated from each other. Not a lot of chance for people to come together and get together and do certain activities. And there's also not very much time for people to get together. Not a lot of leisure time. If you are consistently just trying to find your next meal and, and working your land and make sure that you can eat, not a whole lot of time for uh, sporting activity. The next thing we see is that a lot of these sports were meant for upper class people. And that's really because they're the ones that had the leisure time. So if you in these ancient civilizations uh, had some sort of uh, noble uh, rank or you had a little bit of money, then you could afford to have uh, maybe slaves or you could afford to have uh, people do your farm work for you and therefore you had some leisure time and therefore you could participate in some of these activities. A lot of our ancient civilization activities are military based. So we have things like archery we see a lot of. We see uh, a lot of uh, things like uh, javelin throwing, um, things that would help people uh, in the military um, perform better, and people are always looking to improve their military might. And if more and more people are involved in some of these activities that would help militarily, then uh, you could be uh, better off as a, a civilization. So a lot of these things are military based. A lot of these things are also based on geography. So depending on where you are, if you have uh, a lot of planes, maybe you're gonna do long horse races. If you are living near a lot of water, you're gonna have more uh, aquatic type sports. We see in ancient Egypt, a uh, civilization that was really built on, on the Nile River, along the Nile River, that they had a lot of uh, swimming uh, in their culture. They actually have a hieroglyphic for swimming and swimming lessons were actually uh, part of their culture. And if you all live on the river, well, guess what? You're gonna teach your kids how to swim. You want them to be able to swim and so, uh, there's, uh, there's more swimming involved in that civilization, just based on the geography. So we see a lot of ancient civilizations uh, reflecting kind of their time and place in history by some of the sports along these themes. As we move through history, we don't see a whole lot of change in sporting activity until we get to one specific uh, empire, and that is the Greek Empire. Greece really transforms a lot of sport, and it transforms sport even to the point that we see a lot of what Greece did reflecting in sport that we do today. Here are some of the key ideas around that. Physical education, yes, phys ed. The reason I am here as a phys ed teacher, which I love, is uh, because of Greece. Uh, they introduce phys ed into their curriculum. If you're an elementary student in Greece, uh, then you have the ability to have phys ed. There's a four part curriculum and one part is phys ed. In addition to uh, reading and writing and music, you also take phys ed. So it is introduced in the Greek empire. And if you're a Greek citizen, 
Uh, you can send your kids to school, and if you have the money, you can send your kids to school, but phys ed is part of that curriculum. Another thing we see being introduced in the Greek Empire is the idea of the gymnasium. I bet you all of you have a gymnasium in your school. The gymnasium is a literal, uh, the literal translation of the of gymnasium is uh, an exercise for which you strip. Um, and the gymnasium was a place in each Greek town or major Greek area, there was a gymnasium. There was a place for people to come and train and be able to do physical activity, be able to do different types of uh, you know, wrestling or penetration or just do different types of sports that, um, uh, that they couldn't do maybe on their own. It was a place for people to come and train and of course, uh, uh, the Greeks uh, took off their clothes to do this, um, and it was open to anyone who was a Greek citizen. So it was uh, a, a really widespread uh, opportunity for people to come and train. You didn't have to have you know a certain amount of money to plunk down to come to the gymnasium. Uh, you could just simply come if you were a Greek citizen in that area. Now. Greek citizens had limitations, we'll talk about a little bit later, but for the most part, this is revolutionary. It's open, it's free place for people to come and train athletically. And guess what? We still have gymnasiums much like that to this day. The Greeks introduced the Olympics. The Olympic Games started in 776 BC. And what the idea is, it comes out of this idea of uh, funeral games, honoring the, uh, the dead by celebrating the living. And they do this with their Greek god Zeus, uh, celebrating uh, Zeus uh, by putting on these uh, multi-day uh, sporting events every four years. Every four years they had an Olympiad, and that was a measure of time in the Greek Empire. And they would have the Olympic Games, and the Olympic Games were multi-day uh, much like today, they had a lot of events that we still see today, things like wrestling and javelin and long jump, um, things like wrestling and boxing. There's a lot of sports that are involved um, in the ancient Olympics that we still see to this day. And uh, if you are a Greek citizen, you can come and you can compete in the Olympic Games. Uh, they would have a pause on any fighting that was going on or uh, what was going on at the time. And, People from all over the Greek Empire could come and compete in uh, the Olympic Games, and it was a large uh, celebration. And of course, the Olympics uh, were revived, and we still have them to this day. Another uh, Greek uh, invention was the stadium. The stadium, the literal translation of that is the place for the stad, or the place for the race. So the Greeks built a large stadium in the city of Olympia. That's where we get the Olympic Games. Uh, and, and it was a huge place where people could come and watch the Olympic Games. Uh, it was a, um, a place for much like stadiums of today with tiered seating. And before that, nobody really built anything to watch uh, sporting events. But uh, the Greeks did have the stadium. And of course, I, I'm sure you are within driving distance of a, a stadium somewhere near you uh, to this day. Now. One common thing with all of these is that it's open to all Greek citizens. And really we see in the Greek Empire, the first kind of idea, uh, not too widespread, but the first kind of idea of democratic society, where people have a certain amount of freedom and really Greek citizens are all seen as, as equal. So we see that in the introduction of the Z or the idea of the gymnasium, all Greek citizens allowed to compete in the Olympics. So there's this kind of openness and a little bit more freedom for more people to be involved uh, in sport um, because of that idea that the Greeks uh, start to introduce of, of democracy. Now, how democratic is it really? Uh, slaves are not considered uh, Greek citizens and women are not considered Greek citizens. So how, how free, how democratic is it really? Well, compared to uh, our time today, uh, it probably didn't look that much, but it was a big contrast to what we saw in ancient civilizations. So uh, the world continues uh, uh, to go through uh, different times and places. The Roman Empire comes and goes, doesn't add a lot to sport. Yes, there's gladiator games, but they just become a kind of like a freak, 
freak show, uh, throwing criminals and Christians to lions, and, and don't really add a lot to sport. And of course, uh, after the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages and the Middle uh, medieval times uh, occur. And there's a little bit more physical activity at those times. Um, definitely in the medieval time, we have the introduction of holy days, where we get our word holidays now. Um, thank you, church, for holidays. And during holy days, villages would get together and you could participate in more activities because there was a little bit more leisure time because everyone had the day off on holy days. Rolling through, though, uh, we'll get to Canada. And uh, this, uh, the, the, when the first Europeans come to Canada and we start to have recorded history of Canada, we see sport already occurring in Canada in our Aboriginal culture. Uh, Aboriginal culture has uh, many different types of sports, and I'll just highlight two that we still participate in to this day in Canada. One is lacrosse. Lacrosse is a sport that Aboriginal people uh, would play. Um, you've probably seen it, but uh, here's, a, here's an old lacrosse stick. Take a stick, bend it, and then uh, put a lot of sinew or in leather together, and it is uh, a, a, a pocket where you can put an object, uh, a stone, uh, or something, uh, a leather ball, and uh, they would play this. The, the, it would be a long, long, long field. Um, many, many people would play it. It would almost be like village against village um, type of games. Um, it was high contact, but lacrosse was a popular sport uh, with Aboriginal people, and sometimes it was used to solve uh, conflict and differences. Rather than go to war, maybe you'd play lacrosse against you, each other. Side note, sometimes uh, the ends of the sticks would be whittled into a point just in case war did break out, but uh, for the most part, it was just a, uh, a way to compete uh, against other villages, show uh, how tough you are, and lacrosse has become a Canadian game um, all the way up to today. So look, we see lacrosse in Aboriginal sport history. We also see canoe racing. Um, canoes uh, being an Aboriginal invention, uh, canoe racing occurs uh, from the earliest days, and um, the uh, the fur traders that come to Canada, they get introduced to these canoes, and uh, Aboriginal people are already racing canoes, uh, but they jump on, and the, the French fur traders would have canoe races against the Aboriginal people um, at that time. And canoe racing is still a very... Uh, important part of our sporting culture. Canada competes at canoe racing in the Olympics all the way up to this day. We do very well at it. So two, uh, two prominent sports with uh, Aboriginal, Aboriginal culture um, ever since we have recorded history there. As we go through the 1800s, um, we see early European settlement occurring and uh, most of that settlement is uh, English and Scottish and French. Uh, people coming over to Canada, and so that reflects in some of the sports that happen. Uh, rowing is probably the most prominent international sport in the 1800s. It's, it's not uh, common that sports are competed against country versus country at that time, but rowing is one where that occurs, so we see a lot of rowing in Canada. We're also a, a, a country of, um, of water, right? Going back to that geography, so we got a lot of water. We're going to see rowing there. Uh, curling, uh, Scottish people bring curling over. The first curling club in Canada is in 1807, the Montreal Curling Club. And uh, again, a sport that we compete at uh, very well all the way up to the present day. Uh, skating is common again because of our, our cold winters, geographic location. Sailing is a common sport, uh, that English influence. Uh, sailing is another sport that's kind of this worldwide um, idea uh, of competition. Um, we, we were known for a time of having like the fastest ships in the world with blue noses on the dime and sailing competitions are highly prominent. Again, we still compete at that really well to this day. Cricket is a, is a sport that's played in the 1800s, that English influence bringing cricket to our country. That didn't really catch on as much, but definitely there in the 1800s. And equestrian, we're a country that's settling and horses are really, really important. So we have a lot of equestrian uh, events at that time as well. So um, the early European settlement brought a lot of these sports and we still are competing pretty well at some of these sports 
to this day in Canada. Some prominent early uh, figures in Canadian sport in the 1800s are people like Ned Hanlon. Probably not someone you've heard of. Ned Hanlon has a statue in uh, Toronto Harbour and he is uh, a rower. He is the world champion rower at a time when rowing was the prominent international sport. He invents the sliding seat. If you've been on a rowing machine, you know that the seat slides. He invented that. He dominates in rowing for about five years um, because of the sliding seat and that technology um, is, is kind of new and uh, people from France or England don't think, it's a, don't think it's a really good idea until Ned Hanlon beats people uh, so badly that he can do laps around them and still beat them in some of these races that they go, oh, maybe we should uh, have sliding seats in our boats. Anyways, Ned is also really known for being one of the first professional athletes that gains respect. Professional athletics don't have a lot of respect in the early 1800s or late 1800s, or early 1900s even, because uh, it's seen as lowbrow, you're fighting for pay or you're, you're, you're competing for pay, and uh, the amateur ideal is really prominent. But uh, people want to come watch Ned Hanlon row. So the railroads, uh, which in the late 1800s, Ned Hanlon is the world champion row from about 1980 to about 1985, sorry, 1880 to 1885, 1880 to 1885. He is the world champion rower. The railroads want people to come and watch Ned Hanlon as well. Railroads are being built at the time. Uh, the, the uh, you know, across Canada railways being built by Sir John and McDonald. And these railway companies, they want to have uh, Ned Hanlon row so that people have to travel on the railroad to go watch him compete. So the railroad companies pay Ned Hanlon to row and they get the profits from the ticket sales that go into uh, some of these races. And people go, you know what, that's okay. If railroad companies, they had a lot of clout, a lot of prestige back then, if they're gonna pay an athlete to perform, that's okay. So Ned Hanlon becomes this uh, uh, professional rower and he's, he, he gets respect. It's one of the first times we see professional athleticism gaining traction in, in uh, society, really anywhere. Another prominent Canadian you might have heard of is James Naismith. He invents basketball, right? So in 1891, James Naismith is an instructor in uh, Massachusetts at a YMCA, and he has a, an opportunity to um, perform a, uh, teach, sorry, a gym class. So he's teaching a gym class at a YMCA because the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, was a prominent place for uh, people to come in during a time uh, like the, during the Industrial Revolution when there wasn't a lot of opportunity to um, play athletics. The YMCA, again, was an open and free place for people to come and uh, be educated um, because a lot of our universities, Ryerson, York, Carleton, they started as YMCAs, so there's a lot of education going on there. Um, and then athletics, and then uh, the idea of teaching Christian principles at uh, YMCA's, the, those were the ideals. Anyways, James is an instructor at a YMCA. He has a bad gym class. He's indoors during the winter, and he's got to come up with a game to entertain these guys because they're not enjoying all the calisthenic activities that is typical at the time. So he takes uh, a ball. He says you have to pass it. He nails peach baskets up. Uh, in the gymnasium and you got to throw the ball up into the peach basket in order to score and we have uh, basketball invented in 1891. It catches on like wildfire. It goes across the Atlantic in 1893. Uh, people are playing internationally and very early on in the Olympics we see uh, basketball present as well. So um, he's a prominent figure uh, born in Almont, Ontario and uh, he's a prominent Canadian uh, at that time, introducing sport to Canada, really to the world. As we go through the early 1900s in Canada, we see that hockey and football begin to dominate. In the, er in the 1800s, we see more of these sports occurring, but as we go through for different reasons, uh, hockey and football come to be uh, more influential in Canada. And 
one uh, way we see that are in the cups that we still have to this day that uh, we give out. Uh, the Stanley Cup was introduced by Lord Stanley, uh, who was the Governor General at the time. And in 1891, he gives the first Stanley Cup to the Canadian hockey champion. Um, there's a lot of history with the Stanley Cup. It's very interesting. You should look it up. But of course, we still go with the Stanley Cup uh, to this day. We also have the Grey Cup. The Grey Cup is given to the national football champion, Lord Grey. Didn't want to be outdone, I guess, by Lord Stanley. He's the governor general at the time and gives this cup to the national football champion starting in 1909. Um, so football is way more in our uh, sporting culture, way more in our history than it is in America even. Uh, actually, there's um, a lot to be said for Canadians inventing football and showing it to Americans and they take it and run with it, but uh, I'll have to save that for another day. But yeah, the Stanley Cup and Grey Cup, at the turn of this, uh, uh, between the 1800s and 1900s, we see uh, hockey and football becoming more and more uh, dominant sports in the culture. That comes up into the 1920s. And in the 1920s, if you know anything about the 1920s, it's the Roaring Twenties. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of, uh, um, the stock market is booming. It's a, it's a time of economic prosperity. And with a lot of money comes a lot of leisure time. What do we do? Well, maybe we want to watch sports. So we have the CFL and the NHL starting. So the Canadian Football League and the National Hockey League beginning in the 1920s because we've got, during the time of the 1920s, a lot of money and a little bit more uh, leisure time. So um, these two leagues begin and of course they continue on and we have the CFL and NHL uh, to this day. In, uh, throughout the, the time between the 20s and, and the 70s, there's a lot that goes on. I don't have time to get into it. You can read about it. But another way that sports reflects its time in history um, is in the 1972 Summit Series. So after World War II, we have the uh, Cold War beginning. Um, between uh, uh, the Soviet Union and kind of Western democracies. And uh, Canada gets their time in sport to assert um, what they think is their dominance in the sport of hockey. Of course, the Soviet Union thinks they're better at hockey than Canada, and so they're going to have a series. In 1972, the Summit Series is a, a very big deal. And the Cold War is being reflected in Canada through hockey it's the soviets versus canadians and they do an eight game series one game's a tie don't ask me to get into it but they get into a, a a long battle and it comes down to the final game in russia and it's tied it's it's about a minute left in the game and paul henderson scores what's called the goal of the century to uh put canada on top and they end up winning the Summit Series, and of course, Canada wins, the uh, Soviet uh, uh, Empire loses, and of course, Western democracy is, is, the, is the king. Um, it's just a way for us to see um, the way the Cold War was reflected at the time. I encourage you to look into any Summit Series videos you can find. Um, even ask some uh, parents or grandparents in your life to see if they remember the 1972 uh, summit series. So just a couple of examples of how in Canadian sport uh, history, uh, sport reflects history and culture. Uh, last but not least certainly is the modern Olympic Games and the Olympics uh, were revived after uh, stopping in the Greek Empire. They're revived in 1896 by a Frenchman named Pierre de Coubertin. His idea is to promote world unity, world peace through athletics, and um, it, it doesn't always happen that way, uh, but that's his idea. So in 1896, they're revived, and every four years, again, uh, like the ancient Greeks, we have the Olympic Games. And what happens at the Olympics often has reflected itself in what has happened in history, especially as we go through uh, the 20th century. It's, it's a fascinating look. If you ever want to do a study of the 20th century, look at the Olympic Games and see what happens. Here's just a couple of highlights. Uh, 
In Antwerp in 1920, the 1920 Olympic Games, they happened just after World War I. Belgium has been decimated by World War I, and all of a sudden, um, the Olympic Games are being held in Antwerp, in Belgium. Of course, the central powers are banned. So um, the, the Germany and German, German allies are, are banned from the 1920 Olympics. And uh, we see the first time that the Olympics are politicized. Country is banned from the Olympics. You can't compete uh, because what you did in the political area and it's reflecting itself in, in the Olympic Games. Uh, another example, the Olympics are held in Amsterdam in 1928. Through the 1920s, we see uh, women's rights becoming a prominent issue, and a lot of women are able to vote in uh, Western democracies in the 1920s. And in 1928, we really see the first widespread participation of women in the Olympic Games. The women's rights movement has been uh, steadily moving along through the decade, and by the end, we start to see women competing in the Olympic Games. Uh, just before World War II, in 1936, the Olympic Games are held in Berlin, and Hitler really wants to highlight the fact that the Aryan race is the best race in the world, and he wants to host the Olympic Games uh, in order to, to showcase uh, Nazi propaganda and uh, to showcase this, this idea that he has uh, very famously, Jesse Owens is a uh, U.S. track athlete who is black, and he dominates at that Olympic Games. He wins four gold medals and uh, proves uh, Hitler's theory completely false, and uh, Hitler famously refuses to shake his hands. Um, but we see the Olympics being used for those propaganda purposes, especially in 1936, uh, just before the breakout of World War II. Uh, after World War II, I mentioned the, the Cold War happening, and uh, very famously in 1980 in Moscow, the Olympics are held in Moscow, and the year before, in 1979, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. Um, Western democracies want them to leave. They say no, and uh, starting with the United States, the uh, president at the time, Jimmy Carter, says that's fine. We are not coming to your Olympic Games then. And the uh, U.S. boycotts the Olympics, and then Canada boycotts the Olympics, and a whole host of Western democracies boycott the Olympics because of the situation, because of the Cold War. So you only really have, only have about half of the countries in the world competing in the Olympics in Moscow in 1980. Flip to 1984, where are the Olympics held? You got it, the USA, Los Angeles. And uh, of course, the Soviet Union boycotts those Olympic Games um, you know, hey, if you, you're not going to come to my party, I'm not going to come to your party. And so that's uh, the way that went. And so we're seeing kind of that Cold War dynamic play out um, in the uh, history of the, the modern Olympics as well. Um, there's a ton more examples. I could talk about this uh, a lot more, but those are just some highlights of how sport reflects its place in time and history. And you might want to think about how is sport reflecting its time and place in history today? And part of this uh, unit is going to be uh, talking about that as well, thinking of your own personal history and how uh, sport might be reflecting its time and place in history in your own life uh, as well as in the past. So thanks for listening and uh, hope you have a great day. Bye.